last week we touched upon these parts, right? Um, step zero and step one, where we categorize um, an information system, right? My categorization, can someone remind me, was it at a high or moderate? Based on the example I did. It was, it was a moderate. Mine was a moderate? Cool. If I'm not mistaken, I remember okay. it was moderate. Yeah. So my overall categorization came out at moderate and I was, um, there was an activity around you also have to do your own part. And uh, we really are indifferent whether yours come out, comes out at high, moderate or even low. There are specific requirements to each, right? Okay, so today, now that we know our system is at the moderate level, we are going to select which control apply to us, and then also we are going to implement them. But let's talk a little bit about that. What does that mean? We look at, starting from the beginning, we have identified pretty much the sensitivity of our system, right? Based on that categorization, we agreed that, okay, we are now at the moderate level. Now that we know we are at the moderate level, before we even get there, we had to look at what is the system's mission, right? Again, from the organization focus. Okay, Awari said it was uh, high. Okay, cool. High, moderate, or low, whichever one it is, totally fine. Let's switch it to high. From my example in class yesterday. We identify the system is a high, high categorization, high sensitivity, whichever one you want to call it, different framework, call it different thing. But we realize like <clears throat> the system is at high. Now, next we are going to select which controls apply to the system at a high level, right? What that means is we are going to list out all of those controls coming from NIST, right? Which I'm going to give, I have pretty much already uploaded a spreadsheet related to that. We are going to identify which controls are at the high level. Now there is something that a lot of people tend to forget. NIST, like NIST controls are meant to be a baseline, meaning the minimum required, right? So if you have your system as let me go down a little bit, uh, not high. If you have a system at a low categorization and you select all the controls that are at the low level, that is just meant to be the baseline controls, the minimum required. However, you still have the option of going above the low level to like say moderate, not changing the categorization. You are not changing the system sensitivity, but rather you are picking controls that are at the moderate level and applying it to a system that has been categorized at the low. Why are we doing with that? Because maybe just like during the categorization, you give a justification for why your impact level should move from either low to moderate, moderate to high, or switch um, from high to low, either one. Same thing over here. There are certain controls that you might decide like, hmm, they are way too, even the system's overall categorization is low, applying a control that is at the low level only does not necessarily help um, help the system or mitigate the um, risk you think of. Let's, keep, let's talk about that in depth as an example. So part of NIST low requirement, if your system has been categorized as low, NIST might say, hmm, all you need is just a username and a password, and that's it, right? So you decide to implement your system, um, like implement your control, everything, and then you come for um, to that authentication part, and you look at just username and password, that is not enough. I would like to add two-factor authentication or multi-factor authenticator, right? Same thing. The requirement to implement a multi-factor authentication uh, authenticator is not actually a low control from NIST, either a moderate or high, but your system is still maintained at the low classification. Does that make sense? If people are thrown up a little bit, we will see it. We will see it in practice, okay? Now, 
I know last week I did my system at high. Oh, right? Dr. Murphy, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. So you're saying if it, it's a low system, but I, I choose some of the medium controls, the system can still be categorized as low? Yes. It doesn't change the categorization? No, it doesn't. Okay. It's something that a lot of people do not follow. Everybody tends to think, oh, if my system categorization is only low, that's it. I only need to do low. Everybody keeps forgetting that what NIST gives you is, that's why they call it control baseline. When you look at the definition, even for baseline, it means just the minimum requirement. If something is the minimum requirement, it doesn't mean the maximum requirement, right? It means you can do beyond that if there is a need. So okay. your system categorization can absolutely be at low. And when you come to selecting your control, control absolutely put control that are meant to be a higher categorization. An example would be factor authentication um, uh, control that I gave, right? Okay, now we have identified which control. Um, any additional questions, Stephanie? No, that's it. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Dr. Waziri, uh, Jacob here, one question. So would, wouldn't that new need for two-factor, for example, raise it to moderate? No, it will not. If you're using a moderate control? No, it will not. Same question that Rebecca is also asking in the chat. The overall system categorization is not driven by the number of controls or which controls, right? It is driven by those information types and the system's mission and whatsoever. The categorization defines which controls you should apply, but it only applies, like it only defines the minimum that you need to apply, not the maximum. There's really nothing as the maximum control you can apply. Your control selection is driven by the categorization and categorization will define the minimum controls you need to apply to meet that categorization uh, category, which is like low. But you do have the option to add more than that if there is a need and justification, right? Hey, Dr. Uziri, is that because the categorization is, is more an architectural process and it's separated from the step that you're getting into now, which is the actual controls based on NIST? So when you say architecture, I'm kind of lost a little bit. Yeah, so, so again, from, from a perspective of system, it, it could be low even though the controls might be medium and high. The, the, the assessment from the organization is as that falls into their architecture, the, the system is, is moderate, even though the controls are high. That's the reasoning that, that I'm having in my mental model uh, from that uh, disparate uh, discussion you're having that a, a high control would not change the categorization. Yes. The control in itself will not change a categorization. Absolutely not. But um, the categorization influence which controls you should apply, right? Let, let's step away from this. Talking about categorization whatsoever, let's just use a real life scenario as an example. So I give you an iPhone, right? And I said, this is your mobile phone for work. And I need you no matter what, to actually enable um, some uh, protection mechanism. Like, um, you know what? Let's take a step back. I give you the phone and I say, you need to apply a case. I did not specify. I just said, the minimum requirement is you must put a case to it. You go to uh, Amazon and purchase a $5 case, which is just some cheap plastic, right? Just a cheap plastic. Okay, that's fine. You are meeting the requirements. Let's call that the minimum requirements that's at the low, right? Or you can decide to spend, I don't know how much it is, like around 50 bucks, to, is it auto bucks or what do they call it? That premium case, you can decide to spend 50 bucks to put auto bucks. Obviously the $5 um, case and auto bucks is Definitely not at the same level when it comes to how it protects your phone. Can I say Otterbox is more like a high grade protection and this is like low, but my requirement that I give you is, hey, make sure you put a case on this phone and you decide to go for Otterbox, even though if you put the low one, it's acceptable. Does that make sense? 
any equation on this? Makes sense. So based on this, right? If you put the other box, you're still meeting the requirement. You're even doing a better job. But what is your rationale for deciding to go for other box, not go for the cheap 500, uh, sorry, the cheap $5 um, case on your phone? A lot of things. Maybe you are in the military and you know, you're always in like um, some rugged places. So you need a rugged material, right? Maybe you, hey, maybe you're similar to me. You ride a motorcycle. So you put your phone and there's always constant vibration and other boxes, the only thing that will really hold the phone securely. Um, a lot of reasons, right? Maybe you're just again like me. You just drop your phone everywhere. You feel like having other box is the one that provides the better protection. A lot of reasons, but it does not change the requirement is for you to just have a case. It doesn't say, it doesn't specify. Have a case was the requirement, which is at the low level. The minimum is to have a case. Same thing, when you go back to here, you can have a laptop today. And I, Mariman will say, hey, listen, no matter what, for you to access your actually scratch uh, laptop, let's use Canvas, for example. Mariman can say, actually, that's how Mariman does it. Truthfully, that's how it is. Mariman can look at it and say, without you even knowing, they will say, hmm, Canvas, and the student's Gmail, it doesn't contain any sensitive information whatsoever. So you know what? Let's require, let's request from all students. Sorry, let's categorize this system as just a low system. Okay, it is a low system. Now that it's a low system, when you come and look at security controls related at the low category, what is the minimum that they need to do? Oh, well, have a username and password, and that's it. Other than that, they are in compliance. They don't need to do anything else. You go in there and you just put a username and password. That's it, including your email, my Marimon, my whatsoever. But do you also have the option of adding a two-factor authenticator, maybe via a text message or adding some form of um, RT or whatever, Google Authenticator whatsoever? Of course you do. Is it required from Marimon? Absolutely not. Can you put it? Yes, you can. Why are you putting it? Maybe you're just a security aware person like, you're like, hmm, yeah, I'm definitely not gonna stay with just the low requirement. I'm going to put something at a much higher security requirement. It does not change that Marimon's requirement is for you to be at low. It doesn't change that, but you do have the option of adding it. Does this clarify? Yes, that was clear. Perfect. So what a lot of people also miss when we go to do this work, and a lot of these agencies do that is, Oh, we have categorized our system. It is low. You know what? That's it. Just look for all the security controls that are at low. Once you finish doing those security controls at low level, that's it. We are done. Nobody pays attention to see, hmm, based on this system, even though it says the minimum, because this is NIST recommendation that is meant to be generic. So even though it says the minimum is to have it at low, and that is the low controls are the minimum baseline. Let's look at the specific system that we are creating to see if there is a need for us to add beyond low controls. For anyone who has ever done this, you will know two words here, and I'm putting them all at the step two. When you are selecting the controls that are at the low level, you hear of the word scoping. We call it, you're scoping the select security controls. But when you are now looking at the system itself to see if there is a need to add controls beyond the loop that is requested, we call it tailoring. Is there anyone who, who has heard of these terms? Security sco uh, control scoping and control tailoring. Yes. That's it. So yes. we do, I'm sorry? So yeah, so when we are tailoring, we are tailoring to the specific information system. And if you find yourself in a place where you're trying to select the controls, please tailor. Like we like using the words interchangeably, interchangeably but 
Tailoring is completely different with scoping. Scoping is selecting the controls that are at that categorization, like your system categorization. Tailoring, now you are tailoring it specific to the system based on the system's objectives. Does this answer the question, I guess? All right, so why don't we try that? For the sake of this today's class, yes, I'm moving the goalpost. I'm changing my position. I know based on last class, I, my categorization was at high. Let's assume that my categorization just for today is at moderate, okay? Just assumption. You know what? No, I'm not gonna confuse anybody. Let's maintain my system is still at high since people will be watching the videos later on and try to connect everything, that's fine. So my system is at high. Again, by the way, um, you also have, hardly do you see that, but you also have the option of saying, no, you're not going to apply a control that is meant for a high, you're going to switch it to a moderate because that's more of like an overkill. Again, everything is that interchangeable. Why are you doing that? Provide a justification. And if you are able to convince, the right people, then sure. Just make sure you are doing it not because the control is super hard or it's going to be um, challenging for you. Do it more because it is maybe expensive and it's a for-profit organization and you realize implementing it doesn't necessarily help things. That's a good <laughs> rationale. If you are talking about from like the government wise, maybe truthfully there is, maybe it's the library system and the idea of just you know, putting these ridiculous mechanisms just to access a publication that is meant to be open source. It's just maybe putting two-factor authenticator and whatsoever just to allow access to maybe an informational site doesn't make sense. So you can decide like, man, eh, it's just the front end. We don't need to do that. Again, if it is now um, on the same topic, earlier we mentioned COVID, right? And we said CDC has a web page that is just meant to be an information web page. You just go there, you read information about COVID and that's it. But then whether your system is at low, like low is the lowest, right? Based on NIST categorization, you still have to put a username and password. But then you go to CDC's web page, just meant to consume information and you're standing this application. Is there a need to put that at least on the front end for users? No, there is no need. So you can decide like, yeah, you know, the username and password control, I'm not going to apply it at least on the front end, not for the devs back end, but on the front end for users to consume the information, we're not going to put the username and password. Yes, let's say that we should do that, but no, we're not gonna do it because nobody is about to start registering for a username, uh, for an account with a username and password just to know how to wash their hands, right? Can I ask you a question, Dr. Pasiri, again? Um, if we have a high system, could we use some lower medium controls also? Or do we have to use all high? So good question. I can tell you this. That is where tailoring comes into the picture. There is a, um, that is where tailoring comes into the picture. Yes, you can use a low, a moderate, but it is a part where you need to make sure you, one, know why you're doing it, two, you absolutely, absolutely have a justification for why high is not applicable and low makes more sense. But yes, okay. you can have that, absolutely have that. Um, based on even the categorizations we did right now, when you look at if Marymount were a government agency and the username and password is the only requirement to access Canvas without a two-factor authenticator, I will still categorize Canvas more at, I wouldn't say Canvas, more like the My Marimont portal, I might categorize it at high because it, it includes um, PIIs, or at least I'll include those privacy controls and things like that, right? So yeah, you can always change across. Nothing is written in stone. You just need to know why you are doing that. Okay. There are two controls that I absolutely, I don't care my system categorization, I never implement it around SI controls. One is for whitelisting and the other is for blacklisting. From my viewpoint, most 
implementations I have done. I'm not saying there is no application. Uh, um, there is no um, usage for either whitelisting or blacklisting. But coming from a networking background, for me, every time I'm configuring a firewall, the first rule is around block all traffic, and then you allow by exception, right? So you don't allow everything and say like, oh, by now you're blocking or maybe blocking and blacklisting, blacklisting. No, you basically start by blocking everything and then you allow by exception, especially when we're talking about internal networks. So I believe one of them is considered a high control and the other is considered a moderate, but the moderate is the one that requires you to uh, do blacklisting, I believe, hold on, right? So even if my system is at a moderate, I always, always go for blocking all traffic and allowing by exception. I never allow all traffic and then be blocking it by exception. That's because most of the systems that I found myself <laughs> categorizing and implementing and selecting the controls, they have always been, especially around networking level, any network engineer here can tell you, your first access control list, the first one should come with deny uh, from IP address to port numbers to protocols, everything should. Thank you very much. You completely deny. They even come out of the box, sometimes like this. And then you begin allowing by exception. So a lot of uh, usage here, right? Now, high level, how do you select your controls and how do you implement them? Let's start with selecting. Um, go to, give me a second. Where's my web page? So I'll, I'm trying to pull from the class side. What did we say is more around um, selecting you. Everybody will keep hearing of NIST 800-53. Okay. okay, that is where all those controls are listed. In this class, we are using the four, but just last two weeks, last month, the five came out. I am still yet to even extract Ref5. A couple of people have told me that they have used it. I've seen the announcement, but I didn't get the chance to even sit down and look into it. It just came out, I think, last two, I would say last month in September, right? So give me a are you um, Are you referencing um, Ref5, sir? Yes. Yes, it came out last month, and we're, we've actually started implementing it at um, MCIA. Oh, nice. Yeah, and, awesome. I, and I was just looking at it today because we're we're working with it also. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I'm really glad to see people have started even uh, using it. I've been working closely with the NIST team on Fedram to kind of push things for Oscar, but um, just trying to see what effort they are doing. So yeah, next class I will definitely focus on Ref Five. So now I'm even to actually look into it myself. Hey, you gonna try to switch it up on us? I'm the one that people know. What? I'm using Ref4 in this class. Yeah, stick with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Start out with Ref4, then we stick with Ref4, right? Yes, I will be, I will, I'll be like, <laughs> but there's not that many changes for you. Huh? She, she has spoken. We got to stick to Red 4. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. You guys, a question. Do you guys know of any place that kind of talks about the differences between Red 4 and Red 5? They just released the deltas. Huh? Yeah. Oh, they did? Yes, they did. Now, where do you get that from? Where can I get that? Go to the next page. Uh, hold on. Yeah. Okay. But if you, yeah, it's, but if, also, if you want something that is not too long, you can also just go to YouTube. There's like this one three minute one where somebody actually talks about the differences. Uh -huh. You know, you know, just in case you don't want to read. <laughs> and he, he he says it in layman's terms, so you know it makes it, it makes it a lot easier. Like, okay, so yeah. The okay. original announcement page had um. Okay. Oh, they just added this recently because I was looking for it. The spreadsheet. But the original posting had like delta between what is in ref five and ref four. Obviously, they will provide that. 
yet to see it, but um, yeah, I don't see it on there anymore. Um, yeah, Doctor Zari. Yeah, but it was there for previous. It was there last month. I can definitely tell you that. Sure. I mean, I will spend some time definitely to bring myself up to speed on that. But um, for this class, seeing as this is just something that came out in September, let's kind of <laughs> stick to Ref Four. And then we'll be for yeah, we will. We will. That's also what I'm kind of more familiar with for now. Uh, so, all right. But can everybody see my screen, by the way? Yes, Dr. Bray. What do you see? Do you see the web page or the, the deck? I see a PDF file page XII. Okay, cool. So, um, this is pretty much the NIST 800 53. Four. This is where all the security controls are listed basically in the catalogs. But if you have some time, well, technically, you should go read it actually. Chapter one, two, and three. It's only 44 page. Please don't go reading all these individual security controls. This document is about almost 400 or 500 page. I'm not looking for that. But the first 44 page should give you an idea of scoping, tailoring, all of these things we're talking about and issues. So also set the tone for you to understand that security controls that are in 800-53 are meant to be baselines. Baseline meaning the minimum requirement. You are actually advised to go beyond that if there is a need. So read it, definitely, definitely not gonna go in depth now um, into extracting it, but these are all individual controls as you can see them. AC4, but guess what? I am not going to use this document because it's boring. So we are going to use the spreadsheet, which everybody has a copy, right? And let's look at this. Same thing, same information. I already put the um, spreadsheet um, in the class room. Please take a look and let me know. Hey, thanks for doing that. Yeah, sure. Um, you see, it has the control family, whether the, the class, some call it type, but it's just basically to let you know if it's um, a technical control, managerial, or operational control. And then you have the control IDs. This pressure does not include the privacy controls, by the way. It has the control um, ID and the title and the description. The description clearly states what you need to do, but there are also those parameters, right? Where an organization is responsible for defining. So let's give an example. NIST will not tell you to put 15 character of password. Rather, NIST will tell you to look into defining the password parameters, meaning the maximum characters. Each organization is responsible for defining their parameters, usually included in their handbook. For this class, whatever control you choose to go with, just define the parameter that you're comfortable with. It's fine with me. I'm indifferent. So, I mean, if you want to set a password and you tell me it's five characters, okay. I wouldn't be impressed, but okay. Like, you're not going to fail. So, um, I'm indifferent. Okay. Now, these are the controls. Obviously, there are a lot of information beyond this. Um, actually, let's go here. I always love um, these prioritization. A lot of people do not follow it. But for me, and also if you are kind of like this security professional as well, more like on the risk side, and you're talking with developers and security engineers or those people that do the implementation and do not understand this, please, please, please stop using the prioritization. Developers will love you for this. There is a reason why NIST put it out there and most people, I can tell you, they do not use it. But the P0 controls are meant to be implemented first and then you go into those P1, P2, P3. So what happens is if you have ever been, if you have ever been a dev, you pretty much already know this. All devs and implementers like that idea of building on top of their work. So when you have a dev implement something and now they have to go back and make a change, it might have, have ripple effects, which tends to happen a lot. And it's one, uh, it's one of the few things I found as I do this, um, 
truthfully, it's one of the few things I found that tend to cause that friction between security folks and developers and implementers. Harry, just a second. Um, and developers and implementers and those security engineers. So for me, coming from that previous security engineering and security development background and now switching to this, I'm able to at least understand like, okay, this is helpful to a dev. I'm not fully a dev, but at least I can communicate, right? So I'm able to identify how can I make it easier for them as well? Because part of your job, if you want them to actually implement your controls the right way, you will want to make the job easier. Harry, go for it. What's up? Yes, sir. So, so uh, I, I got the spreadsheet up and, and uh, I'm not familiar with it. So I, I see there's operational system and technical. And then you were commenting about P0 controls are first and then P1s. Where, where do you see that in the spreadsheet? I wasn't able to assimilate to that. You see my screen? Can everybody see the screen? Yeah. I can see the screen. Yes, sir. Then ignore yours for now. You can reference it later. Okay. Now let's take a step back. Um, can you go on mute, please? Remember when we were during the ISACA step, we touched upon the different types of controls, right? Like we talk about managerial, technical, um, operational, privacy, all of those. And then we also talk about different kind of classes and how ISACA usually also include things like, um, oh God, uh, the physical controls and whatnot, right? Over here, it's all bundled into that operational, but like there are different types of control. We touch upon that, right? From the theoretical side. So over here also, NIST have identified, can everybody please go on mute? Am I the only one getting the feedback? Um, NIST also, ident sorry, um, kind of really put the controls based on which ones are technical controls that are focused on technical implementations within the system, right? And then we also have those managerial controls that are focused on managerial side of things, like having a policy document, doing the right onboarding, offboarding, process procedures, all of those things, including like physical control. All of those are pretty much not necessarily a technical from a logical perspective, right? They are not necessarily, I uh, will say, computerized kind of related stuff. Um, then also NIST identified the operational controls, more like your day-to-day -day kind of things, right? And uh, let's take a look at some of those examples. So what is an example of a managerial control? You'll find like around security assessment, yes, but let's go a little bit. Um, I will actually go more into, hmm, hold on. So we have system and services. Most of these, you'll find they are mostly managerial related. There are controls like dash one controls. All the dash one controls are usually requesting for some sort of policy. But even like this, you'll find like the continuous monitoring plan. Yes, you might use tools to actually achieve that control, but it's more around operational and managerial and day-to-day -day task, right? Um, then let's look at like example of what are considered technical controls. These are controls that request technical implementation, basically, like bi biometric based authentication. It requires you to actually see it says the information system for biometric authentication employs mechanism that satisfy all of those kind of things. It is asking you to actually do something from a technical perspective, right? And then um, beyond those classes, what I was talking about earlier is, let's say you decide that you are going to implement, this is just high level. You're going to implement these three controls, right? From engineering back, uh, from an engineering perspective, as well as this development perspective, be it software development or just technical implementations, you would want to do, things tend to come in iterations, right? So if you are basically maybe configuring, um, two-factor authentication, maybe. You will have to first set up your password and then implement the two-factor authenticator. This is a very simplistic example, by the way. Now, assume that you are the security professional talking to the devs and telling them what to do. But the first thing you give them is like, hey, implement a two-factor authenticator. Okay, they go ahead. 
and implement it. But they understand that before they do that, they have to set up some password, but you never give them the password requirement. You just told them to implement the two-factor authenticator, multi-factor authenticator or whatsoever. So they decided to define what the password parameter should be like. They said maybe just six digits as put this password and then later on you can put the multi-factor. Fine. Then later on, after they have achieved the multi-factor authenticator, you come back and give them like, hey, these are the password requirements, the password parameters that you need to define. And I want them to be 15 instead of six. Guess what? You as a security professional, you might say like, there's no impact, I'm just gonna give it to them. And then they push back, they whatsoever. And you know, just that little friction between security and devs that tend to happen. But then in your mind, you're like, eh, they are devs, they just don't wanna do it. Truthfully, you're not making their job easy as well. The reason why I'm saying that is, you give them the end requirement before the prerequisite. Ideally, you should give them, hey, configure the passwords to 15 parameters before then you configure the two-factor authenticator. What that allows them to do is, from their level of effort, as well as the workload, they do the first requirement, then they go to the two-factor authenticator. But coming from, oh, I've given you the two-factor authenticator and you never gave the password requirement, they went ahead and defined it themselves and then implement the two-factor only for you to come back and submit the password requirements, guess what is happening? Chances are, from a development perspective, for them to now change the password requirement, they have to do two jobs. One, disable the two-factor authenticator, then implement the new password requirement, then go back and re-enable the two-factor authenticator. That's quite a workload. I know I'm giving a very simplistic example with the username, passwords, and two-factor authenticator, but when you start going in depth into from technical implementations, even around system design, system integrity, and all of those, it starts to impact the workload and the time from a dev perspective. Does that make sense? That's why we have this, by the way, the prioritization. That's why NIST kind of provided what control should be submitted first or implemented first, then P1, P2, and P3. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Cool. So now let's talk a little bit about selecting controls, right? Let's go back to this. Um, give me a second. Where are we? Let's go back to this we are trying to achieve control selection, right? Based on what we discuss, I give you, okay, by the way, I didn't touch upon this, but it's just um, the document that kind of also outlined security requirements, right? For information systems. And this provides the list of controls, right? Now in the selections, we talk about select scope and tailor security controls, right? I said it is a baseline. Everybody knows that. Let's, um, for the class activity, we will talk about it towards the end of the class. Now, we are going to select the controls. Can someone tell me based on this? Because you're going to do it as well. So I want you to actually, by the way, let me add RAV4 here because we are using the RAV4 version, not five, right? Okay. Because you're going to do it, please make it engaging. I need someone to volunteer and tell me based on this, if I'm going to select my controls and scope them, forget the tailoring now. If I'm going to select my controls and it says based on step one categorization, what was my step one categorization that we did last week? What was mine? That overall Hi. system. Hi. That overall system categorization, what was my overall system categorization? You place it at a high. Yes. Oh, so that, that dictates the controls. Saying, I don't know if it was Stephanie or someone that was saying hi, and I thought like it was a question. But yes, so my overall system categorization was high. Agreed? Mm -hmm. Agreed. So based on that, uh, um, is it safe to say, okay, I'm going to select controls? This and redundant. Select and scope is basically the same thing. But um, is it safe to say I'm going to select controls that are at the high categorization? Yes, without tailoring. Yes. No, we are not tailoring yet. We yeah, are I said without. Then we will tailor, right? Great. Now, going back to 
the document. Where is the grapho document? Here. For each single control, there is the it's been identified. So where is it? Oh, I don't want to see the PE controls. I want to see the technical ones. <laughs> Each control will be tagged that's, as that's rep five. I'm sorry. Oh, you this is rep five. Thank you. Yeah. Um, each control will have its tag as a high exactly. So you see, we are looking at which one is this? P AC three, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to go back to the heading. Yes, you see AC three. It's been identified as. This is all part of AC3, AC3, AC3. It's been identified as it's a low control, also a moderate control, also a high, meaning it applies across, right? Now, I'm not a big fan of this document, honestly. So go read it, but please, if you're looking for something to just play with around identifying those families, let's just go to this. Um, where is the next web page? Hold on a second. Are you looking for the common controls? No, we'll talk about common controls later. Don't they have a document that has like all the high controls in it on the NIST site? Yeah, yeah, I mean, even the spreadsheet here has identified. I just wanted to give people the authoritative source and then we'll play with the spreadsheets, right? Okay, cool. So when you go to this page, it's going to give you the different families, but if you want to see the low impact related controls, you will be able to select them and you see all of them. These are all low related controls. It's showing 115 controls that are at the low uh, level, right? Moderate controls have been identified. They are 149. And I mean, you can see it here, low, moderate, high. And then all the highs are here with 170. Keep in mind, NIST is going, like NIST usually go for the high um, control ID. NIST does not give, like from this page, it doesn't show you the sub controls IDs. If you are to expand it, including these sub controls, it's going to be way more than 170. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, we will see it in the spreadsheet. So as you can see from here, it's safe to say AC6 is not considered a low, con uh, a low control. So if your system is at the low level, you don't need to implement AC6, this privilege, right? But if your system is a moderate, you have to implement it. Even implementing the, at the moderate categorization, it does. it is um, only few of the AC6, like AC6, dash three, you don't need to implement it unless your system is at high, okay? The different control families is here. And uh, feel free, take some time, play with this, but I'm gonna go back to my comfort zone, the spreadsheet. Professor, <laughs> I, I have a question for you yes. based on what you just showed in the prior prior slide, if you can go back for a second. Uh, PowerPoint or P? Where, where it showed the, the uh, columns, uh, yeah, this one, okay. All right, so this, uh, this is high impact controls, mm -hmm. but then there are three different um, uh, columns here, okay? Mm -hmm. So how does the fact that these are high impact controls relate to those three columns? Good question. So even if you click on low control, you'll see it. It's just, I would say from a UX perspective, since NIST is putting a focus on high impact controls, it shouldn't have really showed these columns. That's basically what you're saying, right? It should right. really focus on the high. This is right. more, um, I'm not a designer, but yeah, I understand that feedback. Maybe we should submit the feedback to NIST. But then at the same time, keep in mind that just because a control is a high control does not mean it is not a moderate or a low. And a control can be a low, it just depends there are like AC1, it spans across. It's a low control, it's a moderate control, it's a high control. Right. Right? Okay. And then AC2, you can see some of them, like because it has subsets, like if you have to go into AC2, I believe you can see the lesser ones. So just keep in mind, yes, I agree with you from a focus perspective, at least this website should maybe look at it from, if you click on high, it should only show the list of controls that are at high, even if it spans across moderate or low, maybe it shouldn't show it. I understand where you're coming from, from a UX perspective, but then just keep in mind that it is possible for a control to span across. You see them? And a lot of them do, by the way. Understood. Cool. Um, I will, as I was saying, I'll go back to my comfort zone. 
<laughs> so this, when you look at it, same thing, right? But please don't get thrown off by this spreadsheet. What Nest, actually, let me go back to the website. What Nest didn't do here, again, maybe we, sh maybe we should literally took this website apart and kind of give some feedback. So when you click at, let's take AC2, for example. Yes, it is showing us the way Nest is presenting it. It's like one control, but technically it is not just one control. There are a lot of sub controls within it. Like there is AC2 one, AC2 two, AC2 three, and each one of them is actually a control. You see it here? Control part of those control enhancement. One, two, three, right? All the way down. And each one of them has additional requirements and each single of this will have um, its own categorization level, right? Be it low, moderate, or high. So once you start expanding these, like to include the sub-controls, you will find that there is way more than 170, even at the high level, right? Because you can see a lot of them across. Let's even go to SC controls. It tends to have a lot. So you see, SC in itself at the very high level because that is more on that networking side. By the way, those are my favorite controls. Um, they have like 28. Yeah. Some of them have been withdrawn, I believe. And then there are also those sub controls, right? Within it. So what this spreadsheet does is it includes all of those sub controls. You see, like there's AC2, then AC2, one, two, three, whatsoever. So if you are to look at this spreadsheet completely, I believe that will be almost close to a thousand controls instead of just that 170. Let me see something, hold on. I'm trying to see how many rows we have here. It should be 920 something the way I'm, I just saw the numbers here, right? Could you repeat that again, Dr. Waziri? I'm sorry? Could you repeat that last part again that is more than 170 because of what? So do you see how we have like SC13 here, SI13 here? Yes. Okay, cool. Is it because of the sub-controls? Yes, the sub-controls. I was saying is, I don't want people to go like, and they click here, high impact controls. What are the high controls? And they see like, oh, there are only 170. and think those are, that's it. No, that okay. is, this is showing only the high control, like the higher level control ID. But once you go to like, in depth, we were talking about, is it SI1? Earlier, the one I showed in the PowerPoint. Is it SI? Hold on. So, like SI 13 here. Well, technically, SI 13 has not been classified, right? Um, let's see SI 8 here. NIST, from this web page, NIST only shows it as one thing. So, but then you can see if you go in there, there are additional two requirements three actually, one, two, three. So these control enhancements. So what the spreadsheet did is it includes these as individual roles, including this. And that's how you actually implement it because they are all requirements, right? So come on back here. Now, which ones are the high controls here? If you want to filter it here, right? So these are all the high controls that apply to you. Just apply to the system. Or if your system comes out at moderate, you will filter it at moderate. Uh -oh. To see the moderate related controls. Now keep in mind, there are controls that, are, that do not have a categorization, be it low, moderate or high. They really do not. I, you just have to go through them and look at them and see if it applies to you. There are a few of them here and there. Just based on this pressure, I know I'm giving this pressure to simplify it, but without this pressure, is there anyone who cannot select which control apply to them if they go and kind of like from here. I mean, I would hate to find myself in such a situation where I don't have access to any spreadsheet or whatsoever. By the way, there are a lot of them out there. Even this gives you like the spreadsheet basically, right? But without that, can everybody say, okay, my system is moderate. I'm going to look for the moderate related controls and apply them to my system. Does that make sense? 
how we get to say moderate or high. Is there anyone, because before we get into the next step, I would really love to make sure everybody knows how to select controls. Is there anyone who is lost? Because I know we are always open to being available and everything, but I will also start sending people back to like, hey, go watch the video. We will do our part, Dave and I, to make sure like the videos are available. I actually thought um, one of them was there, but we will make sure everything is up there. There is clarity as well and um, provide additional resources. But um, we will also start telling people like, hey, make sure you watch the video. So always happy to review, but um, please let me know if you have any question right now. Is there anyone who does not understand how to select the controls? Is there anyone who doesn't know where to even get the controls without the spreadsheet? Oh, great. Doc, Dr. Waziri, uh, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to have questions when I start doing it. Uh, can I just shoot an email to you or Dave? Uh, Absolutely no worries. But then, like we are going to start sending people back to watch the video. I do not mean like we're not going to entertain questions. It means like I want to make sure everybody at least understand what I did here. And as they are doing their own, if they get into their own issues or whatsoever, then we flesh it out. Mm. I do want everybody to understand that the reason why I am going into this spreadsheet to select high controls as the controls that apply to my system is because from last week lectures, categorization was at high. That's why. Okay, great. So. But, hey, Doctor, uh, uh, just a quick question though. So, so I see your spreadsheet, but in, in, in my perspective, I think the, the, uh, the website is, is more complete, right? Because the website uh, talks to the, the characteristics that are not in the spreadsheet. Is that correct? Absolutely, absolutely. This website is the authoritative source. So keep in mind, if you can remember, beginning of the class, I mentioned it, the template, the spreadsheet, and all the documentations, the guides, and whatsoever you're getting in this class are not meant to be the authoritative source. I'm just trying to simplify it for people, but guess what? I am indifferent if you have your own spreadsheet right now that you are you understand it better. Please, please, please. Actually, I'll appreciate it. Use it and even show it to me, and I will see if it's a good one. I'll actually copy it from you. <laughs> so <laughs> don't take this spreadsheet as the authoritative uh, source. Absolutely not. The goal is just because I'm not a designer. I just find it easier for me to filter using this. Guess what? Um, actually, the NIST, no, the FedRAM template even does the same thing, but it's a Word document. So if that's your preference, please go for it. Um, NIST FedRAM SSP template. Let's go for the one that is at high. If you have never done this, I would recommend it. If that's what you want, totally fine by me. Just keep a focus on um, what is related. Uh -oh. Don't go into other parts, please. I know like people will want to be creative. So absolutely welcome that. But again, just like the baseline, make sure you meet the minimum ask of the class. Um, let me show you something real quick here with this template. Why is it taking forever? Okay. I have it here, give me a second. So you see, this is even the FedRAM template. Some agencies do not use pressure, by the way. You see it here? Uh, no, champagne. It's gonna take some time. I believe it will, yep. So let's close all of these, these, this, this. All right, you see here, the list of controls, I believe FedRAM also, these documents are heavy. So please, let's give it some time to finish population. <laughs> Professor, while that's going on, can you clarify when you say videos, which videos are you referring to? So this Zoom session are being recorded. Oh, got it. In other words, go back and, and re review the class. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I thought there were some others. 
No, just this. I know okay. like um, last week there was a recommendation on yeah. the opening, but yeah. So you see even this, this like third round, this is how they present the controls instead of from a spreadsheet perspective. But what they did is also, this is a high uh, baseline template. So they have another for moderate or low. If your system is at low, you can use their template. And you see they are tagging it, low, moderate, high. Is this the 853 controls? I'm sorry? Is this the 853 controls that's in there, Brent? Yeah. OK. Yeah, this is the same thing. Like, Fedram also uses the NIST 800-53 controls, but they also have some additional controls that are Fedram specific. So, so, so doctor, so so is it uh, a, a right assumption to say that FedRAMP is a tailoring of the 853 controls? I would say, <laughs> wow, well, nice way to put it, but I would say FedRAMP is a tailoring of uh, because I don't know because FedRAMP is not based on categorizations like the system sensitivity. It is more so for cloud service providers, right? You could say that, honestly, you could get away from it. You can say that FedRAM tailors security controls for cloud service providers and they added their own requirement. I would, I would yeah, yeah, I would say that. <laughs> I just never thought of it that way, but yes, you're absolutely right. Roger, okay, thanks. Leander's also saying yes. So actually, did you go through like a similar experience to Leander? That's why you're saying yes, or it just kind of resonates instantly? With you. I think you're on mute if you're talking, but okay. Um, I, I, I understand everything, but can we go through like maybe, I know your overall system was a high. Can we just go over, are, are we about to go over just how you are going to construct it and put it together? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the part of <clears throat> implementation as well that we are going to do. So you go, I am going back here. You go to, um, you basically pre-populate all your controls or whatsoever, like all of these controls, just consider this as a dictionary. It has not been scoped. You come back here, based on the categorization of your system, we know mine is at high, you select, hold on. Um, this is based on nest. If your system is low, you filter everything out and just focus on the low controls, right? If your system is at moderate, you feel you focus on everything, uh, you filter everything um, out and then focus on the ones that are only at moderate. Same thing with high. Guess what? A lot of places, if like the system is moderate, they will just filter it like this and put a lock such that you cannot even expand it. Some do not even put anything. Like you can see, you have from roof. 439 and then it jumps to 441 and like 440 is missing. That's because it's not a moderate control. And then this is it. This is the selection of the controls. It does not provide you with the boxes to write your implementation statements whatsoever because we are not there yet. When we get there, you will see it. Again, this is only focused on NIST control baselines. Guess what? If you are a cloud service provider, there will be those ones from FedRAM that is more like also low. This is just me playing with the spreadsheet, right? Moderate, high, but it's going to be based on what? Based uh, FedRAM controls, right? FedRAM categorization. Hold on. Maybe FedRAM here, right? Again, FedRAM because it's focused on cloud service providers, then maybe these columns will go away these three because they are more civilian side. Again, if you are DOD, which is beyond the scope of this class, like if you are say DOD or some parts of the IC, you will now be using what? The CNSSI 1253 categorization, right? Which doesn't call it as low, moderate or high. We go with impact level two, impact level four. Don't ask me why we are missing three, long story. Impact level uh, five, and then also impact level six, right? Which level six will include some overlay controls. Now, um, again, based on this, you might have it as index. You know what? Why don't I download one? Don't let it confuse you. If it confuse you, confuses you, it's on you, not on me. 
what about overlay controls? I'm sorry? It's like, you know, is it additional controls, the overlays? Mm -hmm. Overlay controls, uh, once you start going into those IL-6, so hold on, let me go. So from here, IL-5, we also have IL-5+. plus. IL-5 plus is basically that what people call IL-6. So all of these controls that you are seeing, including some few additional ones that the CNSSI um, Committee on National Security or whatsoever, just the ones that deal with the Intel communities, CIA, uh, NGA, whatsoever, and then the DOD sites, right? Um, there are categorizations that are at IL-2, that is impact level two. You can say it's synonymous to low, honestly, low controls are even higher than IL-2. There are those that are at IL-4. Why is you get to IL-5? I tend to consider IL-5 similar to like just high controls here. But then if the system beyond the categorization has been classified as, is considered a classified system, maybe from um, either secret or top secret system, or even getting into that SCI band, you will have a categorization at those um, above IL-5, right? And there are selected controls. Mostly um, beyond IL-5, they are called overlay controls. They are just a handful of controls. If you have never seen them and you want to see them and you have a DOD CAC, you can go to the RMF KS, that's the RMF Knowledge Center on DOD and then pull those controls, right? From You can access it from this society. If, I don't know, you can have access to overlay controls without having a clearance. Yes, you just need to have a DOD CAC. Uh, I don't think they're clear. I, cannot, I mean, if you've ever seen them, I cannot show you. But yeah, um, I mean, the system is also as, you definitely contain those overlay controls and then you will have um you will have il6 is up to secret level so you need a secret like can hold up to secret data any data that is considered a top secret cannot be hosted with an il6 environment that's hey, hey, doctor quick quick question for you on what you're discussing here so so fed ramp il2 il4 il5 il6 are different and separate categorizations over? Oh, like FedRAP IL2, IL4, IL5. What is going on is DISA, which is similar to FedRAP, but for DOD community. Keep in mind, FedRAP only certify cloud providers like say AWS, Azure, whatsoever, but only for civilian agencies. When you start looking at the Intel community and the DOD, DISA, which is also another organization, is responsible for doing that. What DISA is doing right now, because truthfully, it's, it's now that we are getting into that, uh, providing cloud services for those DOD and IC communities, right? You keep hearing about it around Jedi and whatsoever, right? So DISA, what DISA is doing is, DISA is leveraging FedRAM knowledge and FedRAM maturity, because they have been doing it for some time. They are leveraging their um, expertise and coming up with DISA approach. And DISA is also using the IL-2, IL-4, IL-5. Now, because DISA is using FedRAM resources, FedRAM templates, FedRAM controls, but they are classifying it at the IL, people tend to confuse it with FedRAM IL controls. Truthfully, you should call it DISA, Secure SRG, that's the DISA CC, Cloud Computing Security Requirements Guide. And it's at IL2, IL4, IL5, and IL6 as well. But they are using FedRAM controls, FedRAM templates to achieve that. Eventually, you might Thank see you. merge, or you might see them come up with a DISA approach separate. I can tell you there is very strong collaboration between DISA and FedRAM today. Does that clarify? Yeah, thank you. That answers my question. Thank you. Now, if you want to understand the high-level landscape without necessarily going in depth, please keep in mind this is beyond the scope of this class. I'm not teaching a class on DOD and IC communities, but happy to chat with you later if you want. Um, AWS, I know I'm going to AWS to get something, even though I'm with Microsoft and working with Azure. 
they still suck, but it's okay. Um, they provide <laughs> they provide a really um, good spreadsheet, this security control matrix, and it's quite exhaustive around showing the different um, communities, right? And how those categorizations are. Give me a second. So if you want, you can actually pull it up and play with it. You see it here. And as you look for it, hold on a second. Let me see this. I find it difficult to read spreadsheets spreadsheet like this. Um, where is that row definition thing? Oh, it's not. OK, great. Um, let's do it. Great. So this is from FedRAM directly, right? And you can see what we were talking about earlier. You see, these are the ones from NIST straight. These are NIST controls. And these are the control baselines, low, moderate, and high. And this is the CNSSI I was talking to you about. They did not identify it as ILs here because <laughs> the way CNSSI does its categorization differs a little bit with how NIST does it. So the categorization, instead of, remember how we looked at for NIST last class, we are looking at confidentiality. You pick one like either um, low, moderate, high, integrity or server, same thing for CNSSI, but it's done a little bit different. And any mixture of this will result into either IL2, IL4, or IL6. So that's why they are approaching it like this, but basically the same thing. Now, when you come to that Fed round, they also have different classifications, right? So basically this template applies to a lot of people. And now we are going to those DISA CCSRG that I was talking to you about. This is handled by DISA and they have it from the minimum, is, that is the IL2 and then the IL4, the IL5. Obviously you will not see IL6 here because IL6 contains overlay controls, which they are sensitive. I wouldn't say classified, IL6 are not, with overlay controls, I'm not sure if they are meant to be classified or sensitive. I need to really make sure I'm in line with this before someday I go ahead and mess up as well. Um, I think it's it's both. Oh, it is both. It's both. It's hey. a it's a really wishy washy area. You can find some <laughs> FOUO documents floating out on Google, but no one's going to speak to it. I see. So overlays are basically meant to be classified, but they are accessible to everybody. Well, it's the, the knowing what they are is not classified, but as oh. soon as you say X, Y, or Z, well, there's only one way you would know that. That's absolutely yeah, exactly what he says. That's oh. why I'm avoiding the X, Y, Z. Sorry, Cleandra, go for it. No, um, no, um, you're, you're fine. Um, yes, um, wow, I just forgot what I was about to say, but, um, but to pick it back off of what he just said, is that like um, not all overlays are um, available? And uh, I forgot what I was about to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> so continue, okay. continue. I lost my complete train of thought. And then we will definitely talk <laughs> on that. I actually would like to know. But yeah, um, that's another thing. Honestly, please be careful because once you start getting into the golf side and you're doing this day and night, like basically it becomes a habit, then you start <laughs> mixing it. So I will always say this, the best approach is just avoid sharing any information that is not needed, honestly. Like all of these, we all know, like we are downloading it from AWS side. Also like all of this information come from NIST um, website and whatsoever. But and on my part, I'll be honest with you, um, I hardly even use my CAC to go into RMFKS. That's like the DOD um, knowledge uh, center or something like that. I hardly use my CAC to go there and download information and share it elsewhere. No, if I am in there, it's just because I needed to generate maybe IL4 controls, IL5 or IL6 or get the overlays and get out. Not, I mean, it's quite informative, but I don't share those information because as, um, uh, was it you, Jonathan? I can't remember. We're sharing. There are yeah, that's correct. I'm very wishy-washy, right? So I like and I say wishy-washy as that's the best answer we can give right now. That's absolutely <laughs> true. I agree. Like, there is really no clarity. So just my advice, I don't know if other people have the same advice, 
my advice is if you get to those places where you are now having access to those, just tread carefully. Don't be the person that provided the information. If it's like the NIST open source documents, it's already out there. And here's the other thing. You really don't need to provide anything beyond this because at any point in time you start providing information beyond what is contained here, then you are now getting to a system specific or your own company specific information. That will be around implementation statement. So whether it's classified or not, it is absolutely sensitive because it's your organization security posture, right? So just be careful. Um, okay, if you want, you can absolutely play with this document. I think AWS, I wouldn't say they do a good job, but something close to that when it comes to um, documenting this. And you can ignore everything beyond this. Let me even help you with delete it. Like anything here, it's more on AWS selling. And we don't want to buy AWS because they are like, nah. All of this is like AWS guidance. So we don't want to see that. <laughs> I'm just messing, seriously. But yeah, um, this PowerPoint can look messy, but they honestly did a good job putting it together, truthfully. And play with the glossary. It will kind of help you understand what is what, if there is a need. It is not this class requirement. Okay, going back to the class requirement. Because my system has been categorized at high, it makes it a bit challenging when it comes to tailoring because everything is now already at high. So it's meant to like be at the highest standard. What you can do is reduce, right? But I don't wanna do that. So for the sake of example, and just for people to understand the concept of tailoring, not changing the goalpost here, but just to, for people to understand the concept of tailoring. Let's assume my system is at low, meaning only these only requirements, sorry, only controls that have this check mark applies to me. Now, let's go back to the drawing board as an example earlier, right? I stand up a system and the system is now considered a low system, fine, so be it. I select my security controls at the low, I implement them. Tailoring is actually to see beyond the minimum requirement, beyond the baseline. Just like I gave the example with Autobox, right? What do you need to do beyond minimum that shows value, maybe more profit, more security, more whatsoever, you name it, right? What's your justification? You come up with it. So. On this example, if my system is low, right, it is automatically telling me that, huh, I don't need to implement inactivity logout. Inactivity logout is just think of when you, you um, we all have like banking accounts on server, or even on your phone, like you log into your mobile app, like your banking mobile app, after 15 minutes, it kicks you out. That's a security mechanism, right? So that the next person doesn't use it. But what this system is telling me, if I put it, if my system has been categorized at low, I don't need to log out. So let's assume Canvas is categorized at low. And it means my account does not need to configure Canvas to log out after inactivity. Now, if the system is located in, like if you're using, uh, in my remote library, using one of those computers that are just sitting there for everyone to use. It means if you log into Canvas and you step away, or maybe you need to quickly go grab lunch or something like that, it doesn't log you out. You will still be logged in. What that means is someone like me might go in there and just, you know, submit a bad assignment or something like that. But basically someone have access to your environment, right? So even if a system is at the low categorization, you look at it, is there a need to actually have inactivity logout? Maybe, maybe not. So that could be adjusted, but look at it actually. From here, inactivity logout requirement is for high systems. So even if your system is at moderate, you don't need to put it. I can tell you this, a lot of the government systems are also categorized at moderate. By the way, I don't know why. Civilian agencies love moderate. I just do not know why. Even systems, you hardly see the de facto system as high. 
people tend to start with moderate unless there's clear rationale, then they get into high. But for those generic sites, like maybe login.gov, whatsoever, you go, they are all high. Sorry, they're all moderate. Like, and login.gov is slowly taking over as the main authentication place for federal government systems. You're applying for, I don't know, applying for TSA, pre-TSA, you have to go to login.gov. You are going to access your HHS site, you have to go to this. You have anything relating to custom, again, around pre-TSA or those travel authorizations, you have to use. So a lot of agencies are now using login.gov. And last time, I know I'm deviating a, a little bit, but last I checked, I know that FedRAM is actually, um, I know that FedRAM kind of certified um, login.gov, but it's a moderate system. Uh oh, where is the marketplace? Give me just a second. Okay, hold on. I'm trying to see what is the categorization for um, login.gov. Last I know, it's like a moderate system. So it means if you log into your account, I mean, Fedram do not need, like, sorry, login.gov, if you have an account, they, yeah, you see, it's a moderate impact level. So I believe anybody, in the, I don't care if you are going to apply for any job piece, like now within the government, you have to have an account with login.gov. You have must be authenticated using login.gov. That's just it. They, put, they are putting a lot of things like login.gov is becoming the centralized IAM solution for the government. Now they have it as a moderate. Is it safe to say, again, this is using uh, Fedram by the way, this is Fedram. So Fedram control might require you to have, um, to have inactivity logout at the moderate classification. But assuming this is not a Fedram system, login.gov, it means you have to be at a high to implement this control. This login.gov is an IAM solution. It's an identity and access management solution. Meaning it should be one of the basics of the basic to have it there such that when users step away for a couple of minutes, they need to refresh or re-log in. It just only makes sense, right? But it's not a requirement. So for those who are saying, no, I'm just only gonna implement what makes sense or maybe what NIT says, and you have your system at moderate, then it means you don't need to implement this. Part of tailoring is actually understanding like, yeah, the system categorization is moderate. We do not have a requirement to implement this, but it is an IAM solution. A lot of people will use it and they might also use it in public places. They might use it in the library. They might use it in a community resource center because they are applying for jobs with the US Gov. They might use it at the airport. There are a lot of things. So it is only right for us to configure inactivity logout to make sure that we are still protecting our users in the right way. Yes, we understand that inactivity logout is a high categorization requirement, not a moderate, but we are still going to do it on a moderate system and we are not going to change that system from moderate to high. Doing that is what we call tailoring. Does that make sense? Anyone lost? I guess we're all on the same page. Great. So we will go back to the spreadsheet. Any question on this before I move forward to, actually we can take a five minutes break. And yes, I did say five minutes. Yeah, uh, professor, I have a question. Where is that spreadsheet uh, in the class uh, module for this week or last week? Yeah, it is. It is in the campus, you should see it. I know okay. have it, right, everybody? Is there anyone who cannot see that yeah, spreadsheet? No, it's, it's there. It's there in module seven. Great, cool. So let's take a five minute break. Uh, we'll, well, let's make it nine minutes. Let's come back at 8.10. Please, please come back on time because I am going to go into the employment phase and I'm not gonna wait. So, all right. <clears throat> I will be here for those who want to chat. I, Hey, I didn't have a, I didn't have any question, Dr. Weiser, but I mean I didn't have anything that was personal I couldn't say in front of class. But mm -hmm. when you said tailor it, were you going to highlight it? How would you know which one we're changing or anything of that nature? When you say tailor it, how would you know which one we are changing? Like like 
for instance, like the inactivity was a high um, in my system, my overall system was a high, but um, let's say somebody who had a moderate who wants to implement it or justify it, that they feel like they were supposed to make it a moderate, how would they change? Would they change it or anything or? There's really no changing. It's just selecting additional controls that are not at the categorization level of your system. Okay. So when you say selecting additional controls, are you going to go over that exactly? You can go up or down. It doesn't matter. Going up or down doesn't matter so long as you're just selecting controls that are not at the categorization level of your system, you are tailoring. Okay, now my, my question, now that trigger question, my question is to you is how do you know what controls we select? Because I see here oh, for the assignment. Yes, that's a good question. A lot of things come into the picture. One, it's not a one person decision. Two, it is driven by, honestly, uh, I don't want to sound like a jack, but it takes some experience around understanding based on doing it a lot like you would say, okay, for an IM solution, absolutely, we need to do this, we need to do this. Sometimes you also find yourself in like difficult situations. Oh, hold on. Um, I'm trying to see if I can pause the recording. Okay, can everybody see my Picasso art, uh, artwork? Yes, doctor. Perfect. Um, any question around how to select controls or we are good? Awesome. So based on that, I will go back quickly to the spreadsheet and pick one of the controls, just only one, and then I will implement it. So my system was categorized as what, high? I'm going to pick my high control here. Okay. Everybody can see the spreadsheet, right? Correct, I can yes. see. Yes. I'm going to pick just one control, only one control and implement it. And I think that's the requirement that I have for everybody in the class. <laughs> if I said we are going to implement all of these controls, then we are not, I assure you, this class is not enough. Um, where is SC? I'll go with SC28. By the way, personally, these are my favorite controls, SCs. But I come from a networking background, that's why. Um, so I relate to them better. Okay, what is the requirement from NIST around SC? The information system protects, uh, I will select this. It says confidentiality, integrity, right? One or more. So I will say the information, this is me defining the requirements. Ideally, an agency will define the requirements, right? So yes, you guys are also able to define the requirements. Um, the information system protects the confidentiality and integrity of information, right? Addressed. Is there anyone who does not understand what this means? If you do not, it basically means if you have any information addressed, information addressed means information that is not in transit, right? That is not being exchanged. So not like when you're logging in your um, into your account and it's going from one place to another, you don't, uh, that is not um, protection at rest. That is protection in transit and you use a different cryptographic algorithm to do that, right? Um, hold on, SC28, that's one. Also, um, at rest, just sitting on your hard drive, for example, if you create a file and just save it on your hard drive or on a flash drive or something like that, that is sitting, that is information addressed, okay? In use is when the information is basically in use. One could say this spreadsheet is now in use, right? Cool. Now, if you go back to this slide, part of this do document, the FIPS 200, there are minimum security requirements. One of them is around cryptographic algorithms, uh, like TLS certificates will have all their requirements, right? NIST constantly updates that. If you're looking for what's a TLS certificate like requirement, something like this, right? This is a certificate, right? And then you will start going into, I am not going to confuse anybody with um, those um, encryption algorithms in depth, but you start looking at the different um, 
algorithms, right? If you're looking at, at rest, now you are looking at what we call the symmetric algorithms, right? So you're looking at encryption algorithms like um, uh, AES encryption algorithms, and then um, which ones? I don't want to mention that, like the DES, most of them, nobody uses them anymore, honestly. I would never recommend that. Um, but let's stick with AES algorithms, right? So what this requirement for me, since I select this as part of my high control, I have selected SC28, protect information at rest. That is my requirement, right? I should protect uh, the information contained within system at rest. So for the sake of example, let's look at this. Let me create just an environment. You know what, why don't I create a file here? Give me a second. Let's go here and I'm going to, can everybody see this screen? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, this file right here, let's just play with it. Maybe I'm just going to put some sensitive information that I consider sensitive, right? My name. Uh, what next? Some uh, information. Let's save my password, All right? Maybe this. Why do I have spaces? All right, these are all my password. Uh, let's say DOB, we say uh, 12, 12, 2020, um, what next? Wow, look at me, I'm born in the future. Um, okay, let's just keep it that this is the information, right? I'm just gonna save it in basically plain text, right? Or we can even make it a Word document, Let me, but I'm gonna leave it in plain text. And I am going into this folder here. Right, I have it here as um, Ziri Junior PI. This is my information. You open it, you should see this is the information, right? <clears throat> this is my personal information. Does everybody agree with me that this is sitting unencrypted? Right. Wait. Sure. So, in other, why do I have Cortana coming up? All right. Um, in order to encrypt this, there are multiple ways to do that. You can use a zip. Like literally, you can zip this and put an encryption uh, to it, right? If that supports it. There are tools that allows you to encrypt. Um, kind of see which tool do I know that is very simple. I have Veracrypt, but beyond Veracrypt, Veracrypt is what's just what I have on my system. So what Veracrypt does is it creates, this is it. I'm going to now encrypt the um, system. Please, 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 if this is too technical for you, you don't have to do this. This is just an example. Just keep one thing in your, uh, keep, just understand one thing that I have a requirement because my system is at a high, I have a requirement to protect all the information that is on the system when it is sitting at rest, meaning it's in my hard drive or in my thumb drive. How I'm going to encrypt it is what I'm about to do now. It is not the job of the security professional to know the how. Technically, you should, the, the more you know, the better, the better position you are, but this is the job of the security engineers, the developers, they are the ones to, that know the how to achieve that. You, most times, on your part, as a risk professional, you are submitting the requirements like, hey, <clears throat> make sure you do this and make sure you are doing this using <clears throat> a minimum of say AES-256. AES-256 is an encryption algorithm, okay? The how is not the major for you. The what needs to be done is the most important. But if you come from an engineering background, like say, maybe like I came from, then you will relate to certain things. I am not an application developer as much. <clears throat> as such, you find me 
not necessarily focusing so much on SI controls. I understand them. I understand the theoretical and whatsoever, but I'm not the best at it. I am more conversant in that SC controls, right? So everybody have their own background. That's because I come from that. So the how, just keep in mind, it's not the major. I see someone in the chat saying something. Oh, Jonathan, you found the overlays? I don't know. Please let's not share it here. People, if they want to see the overlays, they should go look it up themselves. But um, Jonathan was saying he found the overlays. But please let's not put it here. All right. Um, <laughs> thanks for that, by the way. Uh, just, I hope you did not pull them from uh, DOD because I didn't want to do that. Um, okay, so this is what we are trying to achieve. This is why I have this. So if this is confusing, you just understand that it is not the main requirement, okay? What I'm going to do now is how Veracrypt, this is just because this is how the tool works. Veracrypt create a container that is encrypted and then it allows you to put things inside. Other tools don't do it that way, but Veracrypt kind of does it that way. And um, you know what? I think I'm going to skip Veracrypt. Let me see if I can zip. Do I even have zip here? I don't. Honestly, Veracrypt is the only tool I have. So I'm just going to encrypt using Veracrypt. Here, I'm going to create a volume, create an encrypted container. I'll be honest with you, Veracrypt is not the easy way to do it, but it's also not like a super hard way, but yeah. Um, Okay, I'm gonna go into that folder that I was talking about, which is, where am I, where's my desktop? Uh, step two and three here. So I'm going to create a container, right? And I'm going to call it um, encrypted content, encrypted box, or something like that, right? I will save it, see it here. Next, I'm going to select my encryption algorithm as AES. These are all symmetrical algorithms. Um, wow, DES is, as I was saying, it's no longer supported. So I'm seeing two fish and serpent. Some of them are created by, I think two fishes was created by Bruce Schneier. Um, what should be the hashing algorithm? Hold on, did I even select? Yep, it's going to use AES-256. Do I need a algorithm? Yeah, we'll go with that. Next. Uh, we'll create a small container of just 10 megabytes because the file is small. Next. What do I want as my password for the encryption, right? So this is like my encryption key, basically. So I'm going to put just a random encryption key here. Just randomized. And I'm going to say this is my encryption key. I'll replicate it. If I forget this key, I can't go into that, right? Uh, yep, it's the same. Next. Yeah, password is too short to crack, blah, blah, blah. Makes sense, but I'm just gonna go with it. Please don't do that. Now, um, that's it. It's just collecting some randomization. It's going to create it. By the way, Veracrypt is the one that kind of makes you do this. There are a lot of tools that are way, way much easier than this. You just push a file and that's it, right? You see this format, I'm creating it whatsoever. This and that's it. And now I'm creating my container and that's it. Look at that. Okay. So now that my container has been created here, you can see it here, right? If I try to go into it, nothing happens. I literally cannot access this. For Veracrypt, you have to mount it as a drive. So let me go ahead and mount it. Um, I should have found a better tool, really not Veracrypt. Um, see this? So I'm going to mount the Veracrypt file. This encrypted box, if I go into Veracrypt here, I'm gonna exit this page. Uh -huh. Now I'm going to select a drive to mount, which is select. I'm going to go into that same folder. Step two, please 
if this is confusing, you don't have to follow this. Pick a control that is very much easy for you to mount, uh, to go through. What do I want as the oh. file? I have C and Q already. Sorry, just a second, let me finish this place. I'm taking B and then I'm going to mount it. It's asking me for a password. That's probably a password that I do not know. This is just something else, right? Display password. This is definitely, this definitely does not look as the same password as this that I created. So it's not going to mount. See, might take some time, but eventually it will fail. So let's see. Someone had a question? So mm -hmm. it, it sounds almost like you're implementing a, implementing a, a part of a system here. Yes. I'm not implementing the entire system. You're absolutely right. If I'm to do the entire system, I will have to go and look for that main hard drive for the system, right? <clears throat> You're absolutely right. So you see this? <clears throat> it failed because I didn't put the right password. So I'm going to try it again now with the right password. But yes, um, we will address that question. Give me a second. Copy. And OK. It should mount it as a drive here. You see that? This is the drive from Veracrypt. And guess what? Now I have an empty encrypted box. I can move this entire information in here. I'm showing you the PI, or the PII, uh, move it to here, this file, and that's it. The file is not here, it's encrypted here, and I can unmount this. It's no longer there. Whereas this is basically my encrypted box, literally. I can put this on a thumb drive. Why don't we even try it? You can see that the drive is not here. You can see this. If you want, I can send it to you, and then you use this to unlock it, literally, right? Where is my file? It's no longer there. Why is the encrypted box? It's missing. How can I retrieve it? I can mount it again using Veracrypt. Same drive. Let's try a different mount drive as H. Earlier it was B. I'm going to mount it again. What is the password? This is the password. All right. I paste it. OK. It should mount. And you should see my file in there. Give me a second. And you know. If you want, you can create it and put your cat pictures in there, <laughs> whatever it is you want. Great, so it's now mounted as H. I go in there, I see my file, was the PII, double click it. This is it, right? Now, to answer the earlier question that was asked, absolutely correct. If we are to encrypt completely the system with all the information addressed, we will say, all the information is contained within drive C, right? You can use your BitLocker to actually do that if you're on a Windows system. If you are not on a Windows system, you can use, um, what did you call it for Mac? Oh, oh file vault or something like that to basically encrypt the entire system hard drive, right? If that's what you're trying to achieve. Right now, it's just for the sake of example, and I do not want to mess up with my, um, uh, bit locker. So you are absolutely right. I am only protecting certain information at rest, which is this. Guess what? I'm going to dismount it. Close this. Yeah, dismount it. Oh, I still have the file open, right? Um, let me see. Yep, that's why. And this. Yep. And close this mount. No, I'm going to try it again. Cool, that's it. This file encrypted box contains that I was zero PII. The file is in here. I can email this to one of you without the keys and I'm confident at least excluding that password because it was very easy or whatsoever. But one could say they are confident like it's encrypted, right? That's one. Um, so if we come back to this, this is pressure. Okay. Now that we are in the implement phase, give me a second. Right. 
This is what we did. And uh, give me a second, where's my pen? I'm looking for my pen so I can draw. Okay, cool. So what we did is we selected the controls and I said there are many technical documents that provide how to, tech, uh, how to do it. The entire thing I did with Veracrypt, there are documentations that show you how to do that. Veracrypt itself walk you through how to do it. Most controls, basically most security tools, they will provide you with technical documentation of how to achieve something. Just like your iPhone has a guide on how to implement something, right? Same thing. Now this is the implementation phase, but is that, is that it? Absolutely not. So we are going to go into that same spreadsheet, but it's going to look a little bit different now because we have implemented something. We come down here to where is my SC28. Where is SC28? Oh, come on. Interest. Oh, I filtered it to the leader operationals. That's why I'm SC is a, <clears throat> is a technical. Okay. SC28 is. Did I filter something that I'm missing? It, okay, okay. Almost there. Great. So I did this. All right? Protect information, address, and everything. That's it. So for the SC28, we will talk about this column, column J, and we will talk about this, but let's look at this. SC28, you have to document how did you achieve it? How did you implement it? So this is where I will go in here. Give me a second. I'm trying to make sense of this question. Okay, time to document. I mean, we mentioned about the documentation multiple times. Time to document that. Um, this is my own words. So we are achieving actually protecting. What is the name of my system? LMS information by implementing. AES 256 algorithm then Veracrypt, right? Blah, 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 to just how we achieve that, right? Obviously, they will want more details beyond this to achieve it. And this is my implementation statement on how I was able to achieve that. Now, this security control type, whether it is system specific, hybrid or inherited, if you go back to the early spreadsheet during my planning here, over here, we spoke about how these controls, even though they are out of the boundary, they might apply to you, but you are inheriting them. So you don't need to implement them. We also, identify that there are controls that might be shared between your authorization boundary and your system. So everything that is your system only is considered system specific. Everything that you are sharing between your system and an already existing boundary, let's say the door into this environment, into this cyber department, it's being shared by inside the door and outside. That is a hybrid control or a shared control, right? And then we have the ones that you don't need to do completely. During the plan, we touch upon this. So that is where you identify this control is system specific. Based on early example here, based on this, if we have any physical security requirement, is it fair to say around those PS controls? Where is it? Hold on. Let me see if I can get personal. There is the PS controls, like the personal security. We don't need to implement it because we are inheriting from someone. So personal screening. If you refer back to this example, we mentioned how when you go into Marymount, there is like those um, entry point where uh, people are sitting there, like the guards and whatsoever. Obviously, 
you don't need to implement that because it's already in place, provided by Marimont. You are focused entirely within your data center and focus on your little application. In our case, MLMS. So is it safe to say, or is it fair to say, personal screening happens beyond that, like uh, before getting into our authorization boundary as such, we are inheriting that. And we can even add a statement that says, inherited from Marimount, uh, maybe Marimount Boston's authorization or something like that, right? It was authorized by who authorized it? Maybe Fedram. Just putting words out there. Fedram on um, October 13, 2020, or something like that, right? And the goal here is you don't need to do it, but you still document how you are inheriting it. Is anyone confused here? Is anybody last? All right, this is good. So I guess we're on the same page. So based on that, I will just filter a little bit here and focus on the ones that we touch upon, All right? So for this, the protection of cryptographic, uh, like the cryptographic protection, is it fair to say that we have already implement this, implemented this control? Yes, because I just did that. So control status, I would say implemented, okay? But then also, is it possible, the one from, like the one we're inheriting, yeah, it's also implemented, maybe, maybe not implemented. Uh, Dr. Waziri, question. Mm -hmm. So this cryptographic protection uh, implementation, how do we indicate that this refers to the data at rest encryption control or yeah. fulfilling that? Yeah, here, um, let me go down to it. And you see how I'm struggling to kind of navigate to it. I'll be honest with you. Maybe you should ask Claire and Raj. She will tell you. It's another annoying part of this. That's why we need automated systems. <laughs> I agree. We definitely need automated systems. <laughs> it's annoying navigating these documents. But yeah, um, so you see, when you go in here, it will tell you the requirement, part of the description. And even if you go to NIST website, like we're talking about SC28, hold on a second. Um, let's go back to here. Like you will see a detailed requirements of what that means. Even information beyond that spreadsheet, SC28, protection of information at rest. So you see, covers the information and then you start going into the control enhancement. So there are detailed, I think documentation is something that is absolutely available in abundance <laughs> on what right, exactly. So Sorry, Dr. Waziri, what I was getting at was when you documented that implementation, mm -hmm. uh, do we have to make reference back to that control so we know that it's fulfilling that control's requirements? So let's go here. Can you point me this statement? Is this what you're talking about? Uh, yes, this statement and this, this implementation. Oh. How do we indicate that this implementation is implementing that other control? That data at rest encryption control. Don't so, we have to do that? Is it on the same row? No, the previous one, you know, where we had, you are in effect uh, implementing that other control requirement, correct? Which is the data at rest well, this security. Is the, yeah, this is the control requirement for data at rest security. I think what is throwing you off is this. Hold on, give me a second. I think what is, showing like this, right? Because over here it says protection of information at rest, right? Correct, correct. And then, yep. right? and then when you come here, the title is saying uh, cryptographic. Right, so, so, so how do we correlate the two is what I'm asking, yeah. Information is, should be here. You're absolutely, oh, okay. the protection, it shouldn't have been here, it should be here. Because this is mm -hmm. what we implemented. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Yeah, I got it now. That's on me for putting it here. Good catch, by the way. So yeah, um, this is it. I'll be honest with you. Yeah, for those of you who are doing this, I would love to have a chat because we need to toss our MVP product. <laughs> but yeah, beyond class, 
we will definitely catch up. These documentations are annoying. Any question on this? Okay, so what I'm going to do now is let us go over the class requirement. Okay, give me just a second. Let me pull the class page. What is the activity requirement? How many of you are wishing like, I wish I had known this, like the first week of the class, I will not drop out. You're still stuck with me. All right. Um, the activities, give me just a second. What am I asking for here? So these are the requirements for um, step two. It says, following step two lecture, which is basically today's lecture, um, select the applicable NIST 800-53 security controls, right? Based on the overall uh, system, overall categorization level. We already did this. Basically, you should select all the NIST 800-53 security controls that are at the same overall categorization level of your system. In my case, it was high. And you did see me, uh, you saw how I select the high controls for my system, right? Then I said, below are the requirements. Use the template provided in class, meaning this spreadsheet, because it's easier for us to communicate. However, I'm still open to if this spreadsheet makes it harder for you, there is a way you are open, to, uh, you are um, used to. Just let me know, and then we have to agree on it first. But please use the template. I also said use NIST guiding documents to select your control. What are the NIST guiding documents? Refer to NIST 800-53 document as well as the FIPS 199, right? Um, those first pages, they kind of help work you through. Then I said select the controls that are at your system categorization, meaning for me, I selected high, right? That is my system categorization. Then I said, because NIST 800-53 controls are meant to be baselines, if your system categorization is either low or moderate, you should add a minimum of two, but no more than three higher level control that can be added to your selected controls, right? As it applies to your system and provide a justification for why the control should be attached. Let me explain this. Let's assume your system, this is the tailoring thing. Let's assume your system is at low. If your system is at low, you select the control that only applies to your system at low, right? But what I'm saying is you should also select two, but no more than three controls that are at a higher, anything higher than low. So basically at moderate or high, you should select that and provide a justification for why you're selected that. If your system is at moderate, you should also select at a higher level. So basically you're only selected two or more high controls and provide a justification for why you're selecting that. Uh, you, where do we, where do we provide that justification in a separate document? No, feel free to just put a column here. And just say okay, okay. Justification. I'm indifferent. If you want. All right. I would actually highly recommend that you have just one um, spreadsheet like this, and then you can copy that. Uh, control implementation statement in here and whatsoever. That way you, it is easier for you to manage just everything in one spreadsheet. One of the reasons why I didn't do that is I wanted to put some focus as I'm uh, talking about it, right? I was able to just talk about this without having to provide those additional information, that's why. So I also said, if your system is at high, you should remove two controls. Again, it's part of tailoring. I'm not saying you should select low or moderate, but rather you should remove two high controls that you feel like do not apply to your system, even though they are high controls and provide a justification for why those controls should be removed, right? Then I said, use a separate Excel spreadsheet for the next step. Select a minimum of 10 controls completely and a maximum of 20. I will tell you why. I said <laughs> maximum of 20 because the first time I took this class, someone came back to me with around 200. I'm like, no, this is not a job. Anyway, 
So select only a minimum of 10 and a maximum of 20, right? From a minimum of five control families. What does that mean? It means when you come here, there are control families. We have 13 of them. Just pick five at a, at a minimum. So like if I were to do that, I will select access this, maybe a bit of incident response. Definitely, definitely my SC a little bit, and maybe some RA controls, right? These are five control families. And all I'm saying is feel free to hide a lot of these and just select only 10 of them that satisfy that class requirement, right? Out of the three, uh, out of those, select three that are considered common controls, which is all of, like you cannot use dash one controls, right? Common controls, we mentioned them in the class around when you come back here, what are considered common controls? They are just controls that applies to everybody in this organization. So they can also come out of this inherited controls because the security, physical security is considered a common control because it applies the entire my amount. So it could come out of that, right? And then I also said, select three inherited controls. So I just gave you an example with a, a PS control around physical security. But if you are following this example and you decide to take a control that is more towards network services because it's been identified here, maybe around that external IP or maybe even DNS records, totally fine. That's an inherited control. Then I said three hybrid controls. I gave you an example with like if a door, if having a door is a control, it's shared between internal and external, right? And then only one specific control, just like I did for my system, SC28, only one. And I said, Keep in mind, you will implement it and audit it. So you should select a technical control. And also, please, I am begging you, if you are into this so much, you have done it a lot of times, don't go pick a control that you will not be able to assess on, like in this class. You like, I can tell you what, I can easily right now go and stick devices. Literally, I can stick devices, right? And getting a tool that will allow me to scan those stick devices might require me to start looking at how can I use Nessus? How can I use this tool? I'm making things difficult for myself. While you have the option of doing that, I don't mind. I can tell you like someone literally built a full blown app for me in this class and I appreciate it because they, are, they said like they were trying to get into the field and they wanted to just definitely do things. That's fine by me. I'm okay with it. Give me, trust me, none of you will give me anything worse than what jobs provide in terms of doing this. So it's fine, bring it up. But to make it easier in yourself as well, just make sure whatever you pick, you will be able to implement it. I selected SC28 and I implemented it. Whatever you pick, even if you don't have any technical background, literally you will still have to implement that control. Professor, I have a question. When you say implement, are you, are you going to be providing us with like a uh, virtual machine of a Windows or Linux system on which we can implement these controls or? No, we don't need to go all the way to that. No, nope. I basically just implemented from my system, literally, right? And don't worry, once we go to the implementation requirements, you will see it, okay? And we go to the implementation requirements, but I just implemented on my system right now. Just feel free to pick anything that you can do easily on your system. Hey, you do know that having a screensaver in itself is just a, <laughs> it's a control requirement, right? It's I think AC not six, let's see. So if you said, no, I'm going to just put a screensaver on the computer, that's a, that's a control to me because there is one. Or you can configure your inactivity logger. How long do you, Use your iPhone if you want, I don't care, so long as you're able to assess it later. But um, pick any device, a lot of, as, I'm sorry? As the system. I'm sorry? Hello? So you, you can use your own computer system environment as the, the system that you're gonna be. Yeah, I'm having some challenge hearing you, whoever is talking, but all I'm hearing is like you're saying you can use your own computer as a system. Yes, for this class, use your computer. Or if you want, you can go into Marymount and use one of their computer and break it. It's fine by me. Either way, the computer so, that's generated. Dr. Wazoo, 
So Dr. Mm -hmm. Waziri, the, the implementation is not a deliverable. Uh, it's just the description of the implementation that's mm -hmm. part of the submission, was, right? We will get there. Let's talk about that implementation because it is a deliverable. And I will tell you how I want it delivered. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so this, does this make sense? Just ask for step two. Yes, it does. Cool. So, and for those of you that kept quiet, I will take that as a yes. Now that one control that is here, select one system specific that I'm saying you're going to implement. This is the implementation requirement. I said, select one technical control at that control whatsoever, implement the control and provide a control implementation statement detailing how the control was implemented, just like I did over here, where I said, I implemented blah, 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 using Veracruz. Just don't use blah, blah, blah. I'm the only one who can do that. All right, um, provide a control implementation statement detailing how the control was implemented, not a step-by-step -step guide. So I'm not looking for, yeah, you double click, go to Veracruz, click next, no, no. It is not meant to be a procedural document. It's a control implementation statement. But you have to reference the technology and process used. Meaning, if you look at my high level implementation statement here, and I will tell you, this is a poor implementation statement, but it still tells you the tool and what the process was using AES encryption, uh, AES-256 algorithm, right? So you should capture that. And I said, use the step three template provided, which is in there. I don't mind if you want to merge them, totally okay. Then I said, please choose your control carefully because you will provide implementation evidence as part of the next step. This is the part where I'm about to tell you. You said, oh, all I need is just a control implementation statement. No, sir. The real thing, how it is done, you cannot just send me an SSP with just a control implementation statement to an assessor and you expect them to like, yay, that's it. Absolutely not. You either have to provide screenshot, demo it, record it, this breathe uh, <laughs> um, behind your neck, I will say, and they are seeing you doing it over your shoulder or now with COVID, you have to share a screen and show that it's been implemented and all of those things. I will tell you this, you don't provide those evidence during the implementation. No, you go finish implementing it and you submit the control implementation statement. When we go to the next step, step four, you will assess it. And I want to see two things. I want to see a screenshot and you holding a recording of at least five, well, I wouldn't say five minutes, but no more than five minutes where it is showing me that. An example of implementation right now is this. Um, where is my file? Here. I have this encrypted box. It literally tells me file. I know it's encrypted. I'm trying to get into it. I cannot. Whatsoever. How was I able to show you that, yes, this is effective? I did, um, I cannot log it. I cannot go into the bus. I cannot whatsoever. Now I have to pull Veracrypt, mount this, show you the file and do that. That is me demoing my technical implementation. And guess what? I will do the same thing tomorrow, um, next class during assessment. So because the assessment part will also, like their implementation, you will have to assess it. That's why I keep stressing please, please, please put, uh, select a requirement that, a technical requirement that is easy for you to implement. If you tell me you're going with IA5, that is around um, passwords, fine by me. You go with whatever, because all IA5 is, um, where's IA5? Not the IA5, multiple ones. Um, authenticator management, right? So it's asking you to authenticate. There are a lot of requirements there, but most of them, some of them around password requirements and all of those. You see like there's even IA51, which is password-based authentication. And it's just saying this information system must have a password. You go define what the password parameter should be. If you say 10 characters, okay. All I know is you will set a password on your computer. Maybe you can hold your iPhone and you will show me that, oh, you have set up 10 characters and I want you to try it with nine characters. It should fail, 11 characters. It should uh, maybe accept it because 10 will be the minimum, but nine characters, it should fail. 10, 
it should accept. If you tell me the requirement is 10, just like when I was doing it, you saw me put a wrong password and it didn't work. So if this feels overwhelming, we will cover it on how you're going to present it. But for step three only, I'm only looking for that control implementation statement that details how it is done around that spreadsheet. But you are not off the hook on demoing it or showing me uh, an evidence like using screenshot or whatsoever. You will do that. If you select anything around logs, I will want to see the log files. Does that answer it? Yes, it does. Thank you. Any yeah. questions? Anyone? Yeah, everything everything makes sense now that you explain everything. I, I pretty much understand everything. So for the first doc for the first document for um, step two, we basically just put in a justification. We're adding that for step two, or we can merge it together. Uh, for step for step three, these are the controls that you have right here, and we're basically that that Excel sheet is already provided for us. Now for the implementation, you said that we can we don't have to make it too hard on ourselves. Like for example, you gave us a screensaver example. Now mm -hmm. if we did something that simple, how would that I guess, how would that be measured later on when it comes down to, uh, I think you said showing step-by-step -step instructions. Like if I'm using a screensaver, it's pretty simple to, you know, use a screensaver. Mm -hmm. how, would, how would I formulate that into something technical while giving you a step-by-step -step instructions of what I did to make it my screensaver? Great. So how did you implement a, a screensaver? Maybe you went to, uh, hold on. Maybe you went to, what's it called? I don't know, how do you even set that? Maybe you went to Windows Control Panel, so you can write, we set up a screensaver by going to Windows Control Panel and set the screensaver to kick in after five minutes. Maybe that's your implementation statement. I get that. Now, I when I said step-by-step, step, I wasn't looking for step-by-step. Step. I'm not looking for you to say, oh, hit Start Menu, type Control, click on it, double-click on this, no, no. If you tell me high level, oh, we are using a Windows 10 system, we implemented, um, and I keep saying we because it's normally a we, it's not a first person thing, but um, you implemented your screensaver by doing this, 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 um, like by going to maybe say control panel, you implemented it, I get that. When you are going to assess it, I am going to look at, okay, that screensaver that you put, how many minutes did you tell me in your control implementation statement that you have set it up to? One minute. Good. So I want you to not touch your computer, not move the mouse, pick your phone, record your screen, and show me, like, don't, get, don't worry. When we get to the assessment phase, it's very clear. I actually want you to even put your name like this. Maybe you will go like this. Uh, I want you to do something like this. This is your system. I want you to kind of show me that, yes, it is truly I'm seeing a system that is owned by this person, right? And I also want to see the time and the date. Uh, you can put it all like this on the screen. I also want to see other things, which I will tell you, right? And you are just going to hold your phone and literally stay in front of your computer for a minute. So if you put your screen server for one hour, well, Good luck, sir. You're gonna be there for an hour. But if you put a minute, you will just hold your phone and record it for me for a minute and then it will kick in, kick in. I will see it. That video, I will tell you where to upload it for me to see. Gotcha. Okay. But hey, please. No worries. I just I just didn't want to do something, you know, like inactivity or screensaver. And uh, you know, oh, again, just because I said screensaver or an inactivity, those are examples. If yeah. you find a screensaver requirement here and you put me a screensaver yes that is not a control so if you want to go with a screensaver make sure it's here i reflect on it i'm not sure if there is something called screensaver i know there is inactivity no ac7 hold on let me see ac7 i think ac7 is session no, it's not it's not it's not that i wanted to use it i was just using that as your example i just wanted to know and understand that if I, if I wanted to use something that wasn't as technical as what you did with the encryption, you know, how would I explain that while saying click that, but you made it pretty clear. You just want a high level overview of how I did it 
And then on the next step, that's when you'll access for, for next week, that's when you access more details on recording or what you actually need. Certainly, yep. By the way, I was saying AC7, it wasn't AC7, I think it was, it, even AC12 is not, so. But yes, you're right. Also, I'm not going to, again, keep in mind, I keep saying I am more focused on people understanding the concept. So I'm not going to judge anyone based on which control they select. Nope, that's not a greater requirement. I don't care. If you want, pick the easiest control, pick the easiest control. For all I care is just implement it. <laughs> Does that make sense? <clears throat> Any requirement from anyone on this? How many of you are feeling it's a bit overwhelming? Like this is not what you signed up for. Feel free to let me know, it's fine. Wow. Dave, I guess you're doing an amazing job. No one is. So Dr. Waziri, I have a question. Uh, when, when you demonstrated your, um, your VeraCrypt encryption, uh, that probably only fulfills one part of the data at rest encryption, right? It doesn't fulfill the entire control requirement, does it? Because there may be other data at rest uh, that needs to be secured within your MLMS system. Absolutely correct. That is, uh, someone also asked the same question. <laughs> If we are to relate it to my MLMS, then I am supposed to encrypt all the information within MLMS. So I'm going to definitely do some, um, maybe encrypt the entire hard drive that the entire application is running on, right? Or whatever the server is or whatsoever. And that is when I was given an example that in this situation, if we are to look at it from a, the entire system, then truthfully, I should not be creating just very crypt container but rather I will have to go into like my PC here and the entire C drive here. This is key base, so ignore it. Like um, the entire PC here is what I need to start encrypting, right? Which is already encrypted actually by VeraCrypt. Sorry, I use a uh, bit like a... Or, no. or maybe I could show that the columns in a database are configured to be encrypted. Well, technically, if you, that is different. That is not, <clears throat> you are hashing now or salting, right? Uh -huh. So technically, the database is not what is encrypting it, but you are encrypting it at the storage level. Does that make sense? Right, yes. So if you, because if you start, and by the way, databases, there is some delta. It's more of like data in use most times. So if you select protection at rest, you should encrypt it at that uh, storage level, not at that. Um, I'm not looking for obfuscation of um, data. That is like, um, you know how if you put a password, it changes it into asterisks? That is not what I'm looking for. And I'm not looking like, uh, I'm also, SC28 is not about like how hashing or salting like um, contents. It's just about encrypting the entire data. So if you have a database and it's structured in that tabular format, you show me one table is encrypted. I would like to know actually in the first place, how are you encrypting it at rest at the table, at the table level? Like by showing me a column. Is that where I'm coming from? Yeah, yeah, that's where I'm coming from. I mean, I, I come from a database background mm -hmm. and I can I can configure a column to be containing PII or PHI and I specify the key to use and yes. it would encrypt that co entire column. Okay, so if that's doable, that's fine with me. Just walk me through how you encrypt that. Does that make sense? Got it, yep, thank you. Including which encryption algorithm are you using? Keep in mind, please be careful. There are, there is protection at rest, protection in use, and protection in transit. Protection in use is a little bit, um, I can see can get confusing maybe for me. So just make sure you're not giving me something that is being encrypted in use 
as encrypted at rest. Okay. So other than that, then you're good if that's what you're going for. There are other controls that are database related as well, especially around those SI system integrity. There is also like just a, a control that requires you to update a machine. <laughs> so a lot of them are out there. Any question? Additional question? We'll see. None? 